What's cracking, big dogs? Sorry. Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE. Big dogs got to eat. And it is Tuesday, which means we are continuing along the treacherous journey of Safi Seconds. Safi Seconds is a weekly series every Tuesday that we break down one running back, one wide receiver from the sophomore class. This is the dynamite class. These are the players that we need to know for 2021 fantasy football. Each week, we're going down the ADP list of one running back, one wide receiver. Today's episode is a warm episode, a sunny episode, because we are staying within Jacksonville. I think we're eight weeks in, maybe nine weeks into this uh, into this series. It just so happens that James Robinson and LaVisca Chenault are the next up on our sophomore lists. They are going literally bike to bike in drafts, according to Underdog ADP. You can go check out Underdog ADP absolutely free on their app. Link will be in the description. First thing down there. So we're talking James Robinson. We are talking LaVisca Chenault, two very interesting, intriguing players. One had a dynamite rookie year. One had an okay rookie year, but maybe they flippity flop in value this year. Does Chenault take the step up? James Robinson looks to be taking a step bike after the monster year that he had. All right. It's Softy Seconds. You know the deal with Tuesday. All of the previous episodes where we went running backs one through seven of the sophomore class, wide receivers one through seven of the sophomore class individually. Those videos will be linked down below if you want to catch up on them. If you enjoy the video today, all you got to do is hit the button that looks like this right down below and click the button that says subscribe on it. And you will be getting every Softy Seconds video weekly, Tuesday. We're putting out fantasy videos every single day of the week. All right. So without further ado, let's tuck our shirts in. Double tucked up, double cheeked up on a fucking Tuesday. Where else you getting this? What other channel are you getting double cheeked up on a Tuesday? Nowhere. All right. On that note, we're also going to stop yelling, and let's eat. Before we get into the James Robinson hoopla, we've got a, a pretty big announcement for the brand. We've done a lot of cool shit over the years, right? I've been, I've been trying to build this thing up since I was living with my mother in my small bedroom back in New Jersey. And uh, I feel like we've accomplished a lot. We've done a lot of cool things over the last four or five, seven years. I don't even know how long ago we started this shit. But the thing truly, truly I am most proud of with this brand is the BDGE New York City Draft Weekend. Okay. And if you have no idea what that is, I'm going to link those videos down below. You'll just see BDG NYC Draft Weekend 2018, 2019, and uh, their vlogs. And this weekend is a weekend in which 11 of you guys, 11 subscribers fly out to New York City so we can hang out for a full weekend. We do a fantasy football draft, and then we just fucking rage in Manhattan for Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I'm most proud of it because pulling off live events is extremely difficult behind the scenes, like logistically, obviously. So it takes a lot of preparation and it's just a, it's just a very, very crazy experience. And it's such a fun opportunity to like meet you guys and actually come face to face with the people that like appreciate the work that we're putting in over here. And I've become like brothers with the dudes that have come to the weekends over the years, right? A lot of the guys from the 2018 draft came back to the 2019 draft. We didn't have it last year because of this thing called COVID. And we are officially bringing a bike this year. So we have decided it. We've already booked the Airbnb. And it's just crazy, crazy weekend where we all come together and you guys get to experience, you know, we call BDGE a lifestyle brand. And I want you guys to experience the lifestyle that we're talking about, right? It's fun and games. We work hard. We play hard. And uh, it's basically just a shit show of a weekend, to be completely honest with you. But it's really, 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 really fun. You fly out to New York. I mean, we had uh, we have multiple people from California. We got Texas. We got Virginia. We got Minnesota. We got Carolina, Florida, all over the fucking place. It's really, really, really cool. It's really powerful. And uh, we have four spots open in the league. It's a 12-man league. We have four spots open in the league. And the weekend consists of a lot of shit, right? You're going to be flying in. We're going to hang out. We're going to get to know each other, maybe do a beer Olympics. We're going to have the draft. We're probably going to throw a party at the Airbnb. Saturday, we're going to get up. Steve's going to cook us breakfast. So you'll get to meet the entire Big Dogs team. Steve will be there. Mike and Noah will probably be there. Snacks and Animal will probably be there throughout the weekend. Fake intern Tony, probably getting fired, but he might be there before he gets fired. We'll see. You'll get to meet everybody on the Big Dog team. We're going to be in this house. We're going to be chilling. We're going to become a fucking family throughout the weekend. It's going to be incredulous saturday we wake up steve cooks his breakfast we go do a nice little workout somewhere in nyc maybe we'll play some pickup basketball we go out for bottomless brunch and we drink as many margaritas as we can before we pass away and then we'll hop around the city for the rest of the time we'll go out to it's also my birthday weekend so we always fucking rage saturday night it's it's just awesome it's really 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 fun and we have 
four openings for it, okay? I'm assuming they're going to go quickly. So if you're interested in, in joining and interested in coming out to New York City to hang out with us for a weekend, you should probably apply quickly, all right? And I want to be straightforward with you all. A lot of you guys are like, how do I get in the league? I'm like, it's expensive. This weekend is fucking expensive, and it's not because we're money hungry or we're trying to make profit off of this. This is a $2,000 weekend, okay? So if it's not something you can afford, it's not going to be for everybody. You guys might be like, $2,000 a hand. Guys, we've lo- we've legitimately, we've le- if you wa- go watch the vlogs, we have lost money as a brand both weekends that we've done this, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm fine with that. It is like a good marketing thing, but all in all, it's just amazing to do the weekend and get to meet you guys in person and hang out with you guys and actually form a real community in the real world live together for this shit, okay? Um, so yeah, it, that covers that covers everything in New York. That covers the shelter, the Airbnb, staying for a couple of days. That, that covers the transportation around the city. That covers all food and drinks while you're there. It covers the league buy-in, which is like $250. It's a high-stakes league, obviously, that we're going to do together. We do a live draft while we're here, obviously, and, uh, and you guys are in it with me for the year. And uh, it's just a really, really fun weekend again. So it is expensive, but it's not because we're overcharging you. It's expensive because it's an expensive fucking weekend, but I promise you it's worth it. Otherwise, all these guys would not be coming back for the weekend if it wasn't worth it. Okay. So four spots, the link to apply will be down below. Please fill it out if you are interested and we'll get back to you as soon as humanly possible. What's going on, big dogs? John Conyers here, uh, coming to you with another episode of Fade the Public. Nick and Snacks and Animal couldn't make it today. No, I'm just, I'm just fucking around. I'm, I'm in my basement uh, in Minneapolis, uh, recording a video to you, letting you know about the New York City Live Draft weekend coming up here at the end of August. And I can't wait, I'm super excited. I've been waiting to see all these guys for two years now. It's been two years too long since we've all gotten together and seen each other. So I know I'm super pumped. I know the other guys are super pumped to get out there. So I'm just here to give you a little bit more insight about the weekend itself. I mean, for you guys that that don't necessarily know what what goes on or you're thinking about coming, but you, you still aren't sure. I would just say, you know, for me, number one, the biggest thing is just the bonds and the brotherhood that I that I created while I was out there with all the guys, everybody, and which is awesome. I, I thrive off of friendship and I thrive off of other people, you know, doing good in which that's that whole weekend. And it, it's crazy how three days together, 12 guys in one house can do that to you. I mean, I think me and me and Snacks only shared a bed one night and I think that really brought us together uh, really closely. No, I'm just kidding, we didn't share a bed. Um, I wish we would've. But yeah, for me, I just think the bonds and the friendship was was super big for me and I, I love that and I love all those guys and I still keep in contact with all those guys regularly so I can't wait to see all them. Number two is just, you know, while you're there, you're a part of the brand. You know, well, I didn't really know what the brand was until that weekend. Um, and I think a lot of people don't really get the concept of the brand either. You know, Nick and Snacks and Noah and Mike and Animal, you know, they're they're all goofy guys. They all got good insight, you know, on the camera and they're all good, genuine guys. I mean, I mean that's how they bring themselves when they're off the camera as well, though. I mean, they're, they're not just putting on acts. Um, you really get to see the brand while you're there and just everything unfold. And so I really love that. And I've really loved seeing BDGE success over the years, even the past two years since I've been there. Um, and so I can't wait to keep watching it grow. I'd say number three is, you know, you're gonna get what you pay for. I know the weekend costs a little bit of money, but I mean, it's not like Steve and Nick are just throwing together this half-assed weekend for us and they're just trying to take our money and they're they're not giving us McDonald's dollar menu meals and all that shit, even though that would be kind of lit. I wouldn't mind a double cheeseburger. But I mean, we're going to these rooftop bars. We're, we're staying at a nice Airbnb. It's paying for your league fee. I mean, you're really just paying for the experience of being out in New York and, and creating these friendships and getting to be with the brand. I mean, that stuff is priceless to me. And so, I, like I said, I'm super excited to be getting back out to New York at the end of August. I can't wait to share a bed with Snacks again. Um, I know he misses my 6'10 frame. I got an Adam Thielen jersey for you too, Snacks, so I know you love him. So I got a couple. But yeah, I'm looking forward to getting my ass kicked again by, by Noah in his workouts. I might just go play five on five instead and watch you guys die. So I got a month and a half to think about that and actually train. But yeah, I mean, like I said, I mean, those are the, the few couple things that were big for me. I know that they did a weekend MVP in 2019 while, while I was out there and I actually won it. And so... <laughs> 
so yeah it was it was a good weekend um but yeah this is fade the public with john conyers signing out from minneapolis minnesota we'll see you next month let's get in to thy content which is what brought your asses here in the first place as we're looking at the scope of this Jacksonville team, there is so much to discuss. There were so many changes throughout the offseason, beginning with Trevor Lawrence at quarterback, the number one overall pick. Travis Etienne, they drafted a running back in the first round. They signed Marvin Jones. So they have a new quarterback. They have a new running back. They have a new wide receiver. They signed Tim Tebow. They have a new tight end and quarterback, running back, wide receiver, all in one. They brought on Urban Meyer as their new head coach. Daryl Bevel is now the offensive coordinator. You have Ryan Schottenheimer, the new passing game coordinator. The shit don't stop. And uh, interestingly enough, just a fun fact, Daryl Bevel was the Seahawks offensive coordinator from 2011 to 2017. And you have Schottenheimer who took over as the Seahawks offensive coordinator right after that for the following three years. So they now have the Seahawks offensive coordinator from 2011 through 2020 spearheading their offense. And if you look at what that consists of, 10 of Daryl Bevel's 14 offenses have ranked among the top half of the league in rush attempts. Only four of them have finished top 16 in pass attempts. Between Bevel, Urban Meyer, and Schottenheimer, the Jaguars look like a run first offense. And I think that's probably going to be the theme of today's video. I think Overall, yes, we get excited about Trevor Lawrence being drafted, but at the end of the day, this seems like a setup where we're going to see a ton of rushing attempts spread throughout a few different running backs, okay? And I don't see Trevor Lawrence averaging 37, 38 pass attempts per game, even if they do not have a big win-loss record. But let's start things off at the top with the running back, as we always do in the Safi Seconds video, Mr. James Robinson, currently going off the board as the RB29, 84th pick overall, coming off a historic historic rookie year for an undrafted free he's coming off a historic rookie year for basically any rookie running back but arguably the best one of all time for an undrafted free agent played in just 14 games and had over 1400 yards from scrimmage over 100 total yards per game on an offense that absolutely stunk 240 carries 1070 on the ground seven touchdowns four and a half yards per carry 60 targets 49 receptions 344 receiving yards and three more tugs through the air finished as the rb7 in fantasy averaged 21.1 opportunities per game. The, the In terms of the rate of opportunities, like you look around the NFL and more and more backfields are being split amongst one, two, if not three running backs. James Robinson in the games that he played, the 14 games that he played, had an 85.5% opportunity share. That is the single highest rate among any running back in the entire NFL. That is an undrafted free agent rookie running back commanding 85.5% of the opportunities in a backfield. Now that number is going to nosedive. That opportunity share is going to absolutely suicidal nosedive straight down the Grand Canyon because they added two players. First of which is the obvious one, Travis Etienne, first round pick, 25th overall to the Jacksonville Jaguars. Going to take a lot of the pass catching work, okay? And something that I probably, you're hearing all the reports and rumors are using Travis Etienne as a wide receiver in, in OTAs. They're using uh, Travis Etienne. Each Travis Etienne is going to be the third down back of, to pair along with James Robinson and Carlos Hyde is the one-two punch there. A lot of nonsense coming out of Jacksonville here. One thing I probably overlooked when I was thinking about the Travis Etienne, because he's a guy that I'm fading, right? Right now he's got a fourth round ADP, and that is I'm not even willing to come close to drafting Travis Etienne in the fourth round. Maybe if he drops like the sixth round or some shit. Something I might have overlooked, though, is the type of offense that Urban Meyer wants to bring to Jacksonville this year that Trevor Lawrence and Travis Etienne ran together in college the rpo okay the run pass option where the quarterback is back there takes the ball and he says hey i could fucking give it to you or i could take it myself or i can pass the ball right the rpo the run the pass the option it is really important uh urban meyer basically i saw some quotes i read some articles urban meyer emphasize how important it was for the chemistry to be there between the running back and the quarterback in a run pass option. It would make a lot of sense as to why they drafted Travis Etienne to pair along with Trevor Lawrence for this run pass option. Uh, some statistics from a PFF article. Clemson averaged 6.7 yards per read option run play over the last three seasons, the fourth highest mark among Power 5 offenses. They also posted a top 10 mark in the Power 5 on designed quarterback runs, 6.3 yards per play, and RPO 6.7 7 yards per play. So they were really good at it in Clemson together, and now they get to do it again in Jacksonville. You also look at Travis Etienne just straight up having first-round draft capital, right? And as unbiased as I could possibly be, uh, in a video a couple of weeks ago, I don't remember which one it was, but I basically 
dove deep into what kind of opportunities do we expect for a first round rookie running back? Okay. And on average, they get 14.7 opportunities per game as a rookie. And depending on where they were drafted in the first round, that might differ a little bit. So if you were in picks one to 16, you're averaging closer to 16 and a half to 17 opportunities per game. If you are in picks 17 through 32, where Travis Etienne slots in, you're looking closer to like 11.7 opportunities per game. And I think as a rookie, and I think that's probably realistic for Etienne, who I don't expect to get 10 to 12, or I don't don't expect to get more than like 14, 15 carries in a game, but he'll still see like four or five targets in a game most likely. So you're probably looking at 12, 13 opportunities per game for Travis Etienne. And last year, James Robinson taking such a heavy share of the opportunities in that Jacksonville backfield or 21 per game. You're looking at ETN coming in, taking 10, 11, 12, 13. That moves James Robinson down to like a double digit touch, a double digit touch per game guy. How valuable are those touches? That's what you kind of have to get into, right? It's kind of like a Gus Edwards situation where it's like, we know Gus Edwards is going to get 10 carries a game, but is he going to catch any passes? Is he going to get the goal line work? That's what we're trying to debunk when it comes to James Robinson. They also added Carlos Hyde, and it doesn't really fucking matter, but they literally didn't have another running back to give the ball to outside of James Robinson last year. So maybe Hyde takes like 5 to 8% of the opportunities in that backfield. It's not a lot, but it's also not nothing, right? It still matters a little bit. I still think James Robinson should see the goal line work in Jacksonville, but I think something that's going really, really under, under appreciated, not under appreciated, but like not really looked at enough is Trevor Lawrence as a running quarterback. Like we know he's sneaky athletic and will run the ball a lot, but I mean specifically on the goal line, right? We're worried about guys like Zach Moss who will be covered in Softy Seconds video next week because of Josh Allen. What about Trevor Lawrence? Trevor Lawrence has 17 rushing touchdowns over his last two years at Clemson. Okay. That's a big, big fucking number. So when they're on the goal line, They're either like it's James Robinson, but it's also Trevor Lawrence. If Tim Tebow makes the team, I guarantee you he gets like five goal line carries this year. And if a team is getting a total of 25 to 30 goal line carries, that's a big number to take away from a running back. Okay, so I'm a little bit nervous about that as well. Like, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if James Robinson leads the backfield in snaps maybe overall touches. Neither would Jacksonville beat reporters apparently, but are they going to be valuable touches? That's the question. If if he gets the goal line work, it could be valuable. But if you look back at last year, James Robinson had five goal line carries overall, like literally five goal line carries on the entire year. Uh, and that's for pro football reference. That did account for 71.4% of the team's goal line carries. So yes, he was the guy getting all of the goal line carries, but it was only five. Dare Agumbawale had one. Gardner Minshew had one but it's still a gross number. Like Todd Gurley had three times as many goal line carries as James Robinson did. Kenyon Drake had four times as many, more than four times as many goal line carries as James Robinson did. And maybe you could wipe all that shit away and say, hey, this offense is going to be better, so more opportunities, and they're his. But who knows? Trevor Lawrence, Carlos Hyde, Tim Tebow. I keep saying Tim Tebow. Like, half of the time it's a joke, but half of the time it's kind of real. So I'm just throwing it out there. I want some good juju. So when he does make a play, I can be like, I told you all. So I told you not to draft James Robinson because Tim Tebow was the real reason why you don't want to be drafting James Robinson. The pass catching work is gone for James Robinson, man. That kills a fantasy back's ceiling, okay? You take away anywhere from like 10 to 12 touches a game from James Robinson's pocket. That's what's about to happen. And they ain't so fat anymore. The revenue is not so gorgeous for a guy like James Robinson. You take away his carries. You take away some goal line work. You take away his pass catching work. And you're looking at a floor play. Looking at a floor play that we don't actually really know how high the floor is. All right. I do expect, again, this to be a very run heavy team. So I expect James Robinson to get goal line carries. I expect him to get carries overall. But I'm not sure that we see much of a difference statistically in James Robinson and a guy like Gus Edwards. James Robinson, probably a better player, probably a better rusher. But Gus Edwards, much better team, much better offense, probably more goal line opportunities and scoring opportunities. Two round difference. All right. James Robinson, pick 84. His his floor has dropped out in terms of ADP but it's still not a guy that you're excited to draft. It is a murky situation there, and he becomes extremely risky after a monster rookie season. Let's switch over to the guy catching passes there, right? James Robinson no longer catching passes. LaVisca Chenault will be catching passes, and he is one spot behind James Robinson in the ADP. So you're choosing between the running back and the pass catcher in Jacksonville, in those ugly-ass green uniforms. Currently, the wide receiver 38 off the board. I want to love Visca. I really, really do. I'm just having such a hard time getting on board with him as a fantasy pick. All of the reports out of Jacksonville are making it really hard not to, as you can see here. Coaches are buzzing over LaVisca Chenault. Coordinator Daryl Bevel wants to develop LaVisca as a pure wide receiver this offseason. LaVisca was one of the highlights of the spring. He was the best offensive player at OTAs. Like, we've heard this year in and year out about 
literally every fucking player. But it's better to hear that than to not hear that. I wanted to get into the nitty, the nitty gritty. This is also not surprising to hear these reports out of OTAs, to hear these reports out of training camp in Florida. Because when you're an athlete built the way that Visca is built, right? He's built like a running back. He's 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 big. He's muscular. Like you don't see guys built like him every day at the wide receiver position. When you're built like a fucking bull. And you play that way, you're going to dominate in shorts. You're going to dominate in the preseason fucking sphere of the season, okay? When 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 you're playing against Jacksonville's fucking defense and training camp and you're wearing shorts, yes, LaVisca Chanel is obviously going to look amazing. Last year, as a rookie, he was good. Finished as the wide receiver 46 in fantasy. He only played in 14 games, 79 targets, 58 catches, 600 receiving yards, 5 receiving touchdowns. Also added 18 carries for 90 yards. Those are like Robert Woods-esque type numbers on the ground. So when we look at the makeup of this team, we can we can try to start getting a feel for where the targets are going to go, right? They have DJ Chark. They have LaVisca Chenault. They add Marvin Jones. They add Travis Etienne. They have James Robinson there. They have an elite tight end in Tim Tebow again. A couple sneaky things to note, though, when it comes to the target shares. They did let go of Keelan Cole, who was a sneaky walk because he had 88 targets last year. And I would argue that Keelan Cole and Marvin Jones are very similar in play style. And I think... Jones eats more into those targets as well as Charks than he does into Viscas because they're very different types of players. Chris Conley, another similar player in play style, is also gone. He had 63 targets last year. So you're talking about Conley and, and Keelan Cole both gone combined for over 150 targets, right? We want to talk about like Jonu Smith and Corey Davis leaving in Tennessee. Almost the same volume opened in Jacksonville's offense from Keelan Cole and Chris Conley leaving. So don't let that slip your mind. When we look at the snap rates last year, Keelan Cole actually led the wide receiver group in overall snaps played. 76%. DJ Chark was number two at 68%. LaVisca at 56%. And Chris Conley down at 42%. Breaking down LaVisca a little bit more deeply, right? He was the third leading snap guy on the wide receiver position there in Jacksonville. Here's how he lined up last year. We think of LaVisca as this ultra, ultra um, versatile lineup everywhere type player. And honestly, not really the case. At quarterback, 0.3% of the time. Running back, 4% of the time. In the slot, 31% of the time. Out wide, 64% of the time. I don't think that's like that crazy. 31% of the time in the slot. It's a pretty high number, but it's not like an absurd number for a wide receiver. We're hearing mixed reports that he's playing heavily in the slot during spring, but that they all also want to develop him as a pure outside wide receiver. Uh, it sounds kind of dumb, so I'm not going to look too far into it. It would make sense from a personnel standpoint to let DJ Chark and Marvin Jones do their thing on the outside and let LaVisca operate over the middle. Let him be a short target type of guy. His A dot very low. Let him make plays after the catch because that's what he's very good at. He's very good with the ball in his hands. Again, he runs like a fucking running back. And you look at what Urban Meyer has done historically in his offenses, Curtis Samuel, Percy Harvin, those types of guys. Uh, and Visca kind of fits that role. He, he's like a juiced up version of, of those guys. Like if those guys ate themselves, they'd be fucking LaVisca Chenault. It's really hard to trust that type of volume though in fantasy. Really fun, explosive, like makes good highlight plays. He'll be on Sports Center top 10. I don't know if he'll be top 10 in your fantasy lineup. So, and that's the problem. And again, like I said, I think this is going to be a run first offense. I don't know how much volume there is to go around in a passing game where they have other legitimate options. When we look at what he did his rookie year, and we're trying to develop a trajectory or projection of what we can expect going forward for Visca, wanted to look at the stats, right? 600 receiving yards. It's not it's not groundbreaking, but when you add the 90 rushing yards, you're looking at pretty impressive 690 overall total yards in 14 games. So since 2000, since the year 2000, he's one of 29 rookie wide receivers to average over 49 total yards per game and over 4.1 receptions per game. It's a pretty strong fucking list when you look at the list of guys who meet that criteria, okay? You, I'll give you a second to kind of look at it. And I know the numbers seem nitpicky, like over 49 total yards per game, over 4.1 receptions per game, but those are just Visca's numbers. And I wanted to look at who fell into that group, who who performed the same or better than Visca, and those are the guys that hit them. And I also just want to throw out there, like, listen, I, I know I'm not like the highest on Visca. He had some bullshit-ass touchdown where it like bounced off one guy's receiver's hand and went like 60 yards the other way to him in the end zone. So statistics probably shouldn't be as good as they were. And he might not hit this threshold of those players had that shit not happened. But that's neither here nor here. Now, based on the numbers and the situation, like Visca is definitely on a trajectory to be to be a player in the NFL. You know, my personal take on Visca outside of those numbers, though, outside of those nitpicky numbers, is that I just don't know how good he is as an actual NFL wide receiver. I wasn't overly impressed with him when I was like watching the tape. I wasn't overly impressed with him 
uh, outside of just making flashy plays and outside of running guys over and his yak ability and whatnot. I wanted to see what Matt Harmon thought of him in the reception perception, and it kind of echoed what I saw. He was definitely not very refined last year. So you see his success versus man coverage in the 23rd percentile, his success versus press coverage, the 23rd percentile, his best at- attribute, which is still below average, 43rd percentile against zone. So again, he needs to improve as a separator. That doesn't mean he can't improve as a separator. It doesn't mean he can't be a big time player. It doesn't mean he can't have successful fantasy seasons because we've also seen guys like Juju Smith-Schuster and Cooper Cup excel as slot guys and be great for fantasy for for years to come. And that's certainly in the range of outcome for LaVisca Chenault. But I like to draft guys who are at least like in a pass first offense, uh, explosive offenses that are going to score a lot. So at least if you're not a separator, you're still putting yourself in scoring opportunities. Uh, And at worst, at least like the wide receiver two on the team, we really don't know what this Jaguars offense is going to present to us in fantasy, what it's going to be like for almost any of the players on the team. And maybe I'll get a share of Visca because he's exciting. But at this point, he's the 84th pick, right? Him and him and James Robinson are both like 80. It's like 84.3, 84.6. That's the end of the seventh round, folks. That is the end of the seventh round. And I don't see the hype chamber stopping anytime soon. Again, when you have a guy built like him, you're going to have reports all offseason about how good he looks because he's simply a better athlete than everybody else. You don't need to be a premier separator to dominate in spring short practices, okay? So that he is like the type of, he is like beat-off material for beat reporters. That's exactly what LaVisca Chenault is. At the end of the seventh round, I don't know, man. I, th- I think I would probably look elsewhere besides LaVisca. To be honest with you, I think Marvin Jones is probably the best fantasy value at the wide receiver position on this team. So my overall take is this James Robinson's floor absolutely disappears underneath him. Pass catching work is going to ETN. Some opportunities are going to Carlos Hyde. Trevor Lawrence might eat some shit up on the goal line. So I don't love James Robinson this year. Great player, shitty opportunity case for him. LaVisca Chenault, I don't know if I buy into him as a real legit NFL wider. He's a guy that I'd rather wait to see him succeed on the field and then buy at higher prices than to hope he gets better as a separator because there are already so many players going in the seventh round like the Jerry Judys those guys who have already proven themselves to be high level separators and wide receivers at the NFL level let me know what you think about this Jacksonville Jaguars offense because there are so many fucking moving parts there's so much to overcome here and there's a lot to a lot to like a lot to dislike and it's one of the more difficult fantasy situations that we've encountered I think as a community over the last five or so years. And speaking of community, again, y'all, if you want to come to the BDGE NYC Draft Weekend, I will probably plug it in every video this week. And I'm assuming, I'm assuming that all four spots will be filled up by the end of the weekend. So do so quickly, please. The form to apply will be down below. Again, it's expensive. I'm very aware of that, but we're not taking your money. We are using it to the best of our ability to show you the best possible time in New York City for the weekend. I love y'all. If you enjoyed, hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you're new, and I will see you tomorrow on my bust-proof player list.